right, so in this video, I'm going to walk you through the RV park development model. Uh, this one I'm particularly excited about because um, I'm actually using this one on a live deal that I'm currently sharing on the website. Um, and if you want to learn more about that and you're on YouTube and not directly on our site, you can click on the link below and you can um, go to the website and it'll, it'll tell you more about the actual live deal that not only are we going to share here just in the model, but we're going to share updates about the development process and even the operating process as things get going. So there'll be lots of content coming from this particular deal, um, hopefully for years to come on the website. Um, so yeah, let's um, go through the details of this model. Um, I'll show you how everything works here. It's, it's very intuitive and simple and looks a lot like my other models. Um, you have four tabs below here, the summary tab, which is where you put almost all of your inputs, uh, the annual cash flow tab, the monthly cash flow tab, uh, and then the waterfall model. So I'll walk through the summary tab first here. So, um, and I'll go through each box. So up here you have general info, you'll put in your address, um, the number of sites that you have within your project. You have your timing info with your analysis start. So as with all the models, everything that's blue, um, all the blue cells are the ones that uh, you can update and will impact the model um, or the returns in the model. So you have your analysis start. Uh, you have your construction start date, which should be blue. So I'm actually going to change that live while we're recording this. Um, construction completion. Uh, you can... Oh, you can put in your um, construction duration here, and then you put in your hold period, which goes up to 10 years. And then you'll have your exit date. Below here, you have your sources and uses. So um, the particular project that you're looking at, or what you're looking at here is actually a live deal. And so while there's equity, there is no debt. And the reason is we are trying to go out and raise all equity for this project. Um, just based on the current interest rate environment we are, we're in right now where interest rates are high and construction loans are, are almost always floating rate debt. And so we want to avoid, um, any type of interest rate risk. Um, and more on that in other videos. We won't go into the, uh, further details now. So what you're seeing here is all equity. Um, and then we have your budget here, which is you put in your budget line items here. And, you know, while this is, Black text, you can update any of this stuff. It doesn't impact the model. So this is just particular for our deal. Um, you have your inputs down here. Uh, this actually should be black. So I'll change that. Um, you have your GC fee. Uh, marketing input, development fee down here, and then contingency. And then below that, you have your development financing assumptions. Now, here we have no debt, but, you know, as with all our other models, because we don't use circular references, we have this uh, LTC or loan to cost control. So oop, you can type in um, here. And, and what happens is this first cell will calculate um, um, the debt without any interest reserve. So that's why you see the discrepancy. But in order to avoid the circular references, and we have content on our website about this, um, and if you want to go deep into why we don't use circular references and how to build them, we have our accelerator program uh, as well. But nonetheless, you, you type in your, um, your loan to cost control uh, to a percent that's close to where you expect your actual loan to cost to be. And then you can actually come up here um, and dial it in using uh, Goal Seek. So the way that works, real quick, I'll show you. You come up here, you click Goal Seek. And let's say we want to set that to a 60% loan to cost. You do 0.6 in this uh, set cell. Sorry, let me, let me back up. You do set cell. You click on the cell you want to set the value to. You type the value 0.6 and then you do by changing which cell and you'll click on D46 up here and you'll click OK. And that'll dial you in. So we'll cancel that. And, and additionally, you'll dial in your loan fee down here. So you'll plug that in manually. 
Um, I'm going to cancel just to keep the things as it, as is. And actually, let's go back to zero. So that's your development financing assumptions. And then below that, you have your uh, permanent debt assumptions here. So one thing to be certain of uh, when you do this, and maybe I'll put in some conditional formatting, is make sure that your loan amount that you get from your permanent financing is larger than uh, the total debt amount. Because if you don't do that, you'll still have some construction financing remaining and you'll be paying interest on that all the way through the model. So make sure that when you're doing this that you notice or that you check to make sure that your loan amount is actually, uh, your permanent loan amount is taking out your construction financing completely. All right, so moving over to the right, this is a, um, a business plan. And maybe I'll change this because our strategy specifically is to develop with all equity. So I'll change this to, um, we'll do total equity in the deal. I may we'll do that deal um, for development. And then um, the refi at stabilization date. And so that date's actually uh, down here. You can plug that in. And then proceeds back in here. In this particular deal, we're getting all of our proceeds back. Or we expect to. So there's no equity remaining. Um, this shows your average annual cash flow to the partnership. And then if you have a cash on cash return because there's money still in the deal, it'll show the average here. And then we have additional returns um, below. And that's our typical returns. Here I put in <clears throat> a development yield. And you can partly see why I'm so excited about this particular deal. Um, oh, I'm sorry, before we get down here, you'll see we have um, a spot to put in an image of your project. This is actually a picture of the site uh, that we're working on. That's Olympic National Park behind it. Um, and so here you have your typical um, returns that we like to see, which is total cash outflow, total profit, your equity multiple, and then your IRR. And you have it at the project level and then the partnership level. So below that, you have your assumptions. Up top here is revenue. Um, for annual, uh, for average annual occupancy, this is actually driven here in the monthly cash flow tab, and I'll show you here. So we have this um, uh, seasonality, and so what you'll do is you'll pick your peak month. Um, so you pick your peak month when it's the most busy. Open that up a little bit. And then seasonality works sort of in a um, like an S curve fashion where like it you know it ebbs and flows. It's real busy in high season in this park. It's through the summer months and then it gets um, uh, slow over the winter months. And so you can pick your steepness down here. So um, you'll have your peak month. This will be your steepness. Um, and so if you go the higher the number, um, the less steep. It is, so it's counterintuitive. And the lower the number, the more steep. And you'll notice how the occupancy gets impacted based on your curve, based on your seasonality curve. Um, so you'll, if you want to dial in your occupancy, you pretty much come here and you'll mess around with, um, oops. You'll mess around here with your, um, your curve and that'll help you dial in your occupancy. So our occupancy is pegged at 68%. And then below of other income, I'm, I have utility reimbursement. This was in, intentionally supposed to be a um, sort of a catch-all development model for manufactured housing as well. And so I kept this utility reimbursement line item here, which is more common for that asset class. Um, but I removed it because I, I think I'm just going to build a manufactured housing development model itself. Now, I'm leaving it in because maybe in some parks there's this utility reimbursement um, concept and you can charge the the guests. Uh, but nonetheless, it's not working through the model. It's just sort of this blank spot, which is, I guess, a holdover for people to comment and say, yes, we do want it or not. And then I can just add it back in. Um, your store and amenities, things you charge daily outside of your your space rental, ability to put in here, laundry. Um and then just sort of a global percent increase a year for really the entire model. So it's not just 
um, for revenue. It's also um, for expenses. So maybe it's not the best layout for that, but nonetheless, that's there. I'll leave it here for now. So down here we have expenses. We have um, cost of goods sold, percent of store income up here. So you can dial that in. Um, line items, and you can change these line items also. But here are the line items we picked. Um, supplies, supplies. I have a percent fix, percent variable, and then for utilities as well. Um, so you can change those as needed. Um, and then, yeah, so you'll see some of these are based on a percent of effective gross income in year one, and then others you can just put in the dollar amount. So moving below, we have our exit assumptions, dial on the exit cap rate, and then the sale expenses. And then here we have a sensitivity analysis based on the ADR and um, potential occupancy. So now that um, I'm looking at this, you'll notice going across the rows that all of the return metrics are the same. And if we come up here, we'll see it's because uh, when you do data tables, um, the things that you are sensitizing need to be direct inputs. So for example, we have ADR, and the ADR is hard-coded assumption. However, occupancy in a previous iteration of this model was but now that we have the seasonality inputs <clears throat> over here, that's no longer the case. And so now this is not working. So um, what we'll do is we will change the sensitivity from occupancy up here. Let's use, uh, maybe we'll do exit cap rate. So I'll update this table now live. And so you get a little bonus um, lesson out of this. So let's do, um, I'm updating the assumptions to be closer to what we see here. So let's do 7 .8, 7.5, 8%, 8.5%, 8 and then 9%. And again, because they're blue, you can update this. And now we'll have to redo. Here, what I'll do is delete that. And we will redo the data table. Come up here to data, data tables. And then for the row input, R, and for the column, we'll put our exit cap rate. Click OK. Oh, sorry, I did that backwards. For the row input, we'll put our <laughs> uh, exit cap rate. And then for the column input, we will put our ADR. And there we have it. Okay, so we now have a sensitivity analysis on ADR, exit cap rate. And unfortunately, as of now, if anybody wanted to do a sensitivity on um, annual occupancy, they'll just have to manually update and check out the returns, which is, is fine. All right, so let's move on to um, the next tab. All right, so that is the annual cash flow tab. Um, here you'll see we have the development cash outflows, the operating cash flows. Um, here you can see your debt service coverage ratio and your debt yield. Um, you also have your OPEX ratio here. Um, your EGR per site. I'm just pointing out the things that are unique um, to uh, the cash flow line items. Everything else is pretty standard. Uh, and here you have your disposition, unlevered cash flow, levered cash flow. So pretty straightforward. And then you have your um, monthly cash flows. Um, so it's a, it's a little different than the annual. Here you have, again, your development cash outflow, your draw schedule, so you'll have your equity, and then if we had debt, the debt will flow through. And then here's where um, you will drop in your SOFR curve projections, um, or any um, 
any benchmark you're pegging your your interest your um, interest rate to. So maybe it's the prime rate or another rate. You can just simply update that, and then you can drop in your um, rate projections here. Um, and then here you put your your I have basis points above the curve. Really, it's just be percent above the curve because we are typing in it. We are typing it in as a percent, not uh, points. Uh, and here's your interest rate, and then your actual interest rate down here. And then you'll have your loan fees, which come in from the summary tab. Um, that's it. And then we talked about the seasonality, and that impacts um, your vacancy and credit loss line item. And then everything else is pretty straightforward. Uh, and similar to um, the annual cash flow tab. And finally, you have your waterfall cash flow tab. You can alter between IR and equity multiple. Um, you could do a preferred return for the LP or not. And you have your hurdles, your promote, and then your second hurdle. Oh, and down here, you have your asset management fee. So on this deal that I'm working on, I'm, uh, we're doing a percent of NOI. So rather than a percent of assets under management, um, for us, it's more incentive-based. So if somebody's investing with us, it's, um, uh, you know, we're not just charging on the value of the asset. We have to execute and perform. So if the NOI is not great, then our fee won't be great uh, as, as the manager. So that's how we um, do our asset management fees. Um, that's it. So I hope that's helpful. Again, this is the, the first version, so I'm sure there'll be updates going down the road. Um, and yeah, I hope this is helpful for you. Um, whether you're doing your own project or whether you're considering working with us uh, on this deal. So um, thanks a lot, and I'll see you in the next video.